listening to VOA One, the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases, especially written, for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Katie Weaver. John Russell and Dan Novak. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Katie Weaver. A nationwide strike in Myanmar marked the one year anniversary of the army's takeover of the government. Protests and violence across the Southeast Asian nation have raised international concern over the struggle for power. Images and video on social media showed that a silent strike was taking place Tuesday in Myanmar's largest city of Yangon and other towns. People stayed home and businesses shut their doors in a show of opposition to military rule. Violence was also reported. Myanmar, formerly known as Burma, faces a rebellion that some United Nations experts are calling a civil war. Local media said an explosion killed at least two people and injured many more. It happened at a pro military demonstration in a town on the eastern border with Thailand. The cause of the explosion is not clear. The military took over Myanmar's government on February 1, 2021. It ousted the elected government of Aung San Suu Kyi. Her League for Democracy party was about to begin a second term in office. The party had won a large victory in the election of November 2020. Widespread nonviolent demonstrations followed the army's takeover. But armed resistance arose after protesters were faced with deadly force. About 1,500 civilians have been killed, but the military government has been unable to stop the opposition. The UN Human Rights Agency says at least 11,787 people were illegally detained in the past year, including 8,792 who continue to be held. The anniversary has gained international attention, especially from the United States and Western nations critical of the military takeover. The U.S., Britain, and Canada on Monday placed new sanctions on the military. The U.S. also joined other countries calling for an international halt to arms sales to Myanmar. Pro-democracy demonstrations were held in several towns and cities before the start of the nationwide strike on Tuesday. At that time, security forces are less likely to be out on the streets. Protesters carried signs and shouted anti-military slogans in Yangon, Mandalay, and Sagain. State-operated media reported that many business owners who had announced plans to close Tuesday were arrested. We might be arrested and spend our life in jail if we're lucky. We might be tortured and killed if we're unlucky, said youth activist Nan Lin. Opposition fighters also claimed to have carried out bombings Tuesday in 11 areas of Yangon. The bombings targeted a police station and homes of military officers, among other sites. 
in Tachilaik in eastern Myanmar, an explosion at a pro-government event killed two people and injured at least 37 others. No one has claimed responsibility for the attack. Early in the day, leaders of the opposing sides released speeches online to mark the anniversary of the army's takeover. Dua Lashila is acting president of the opposition's National Unity Government. He said his group will carry on with the People's Revolution against military rule. The NUG was created by elected lawmakers and considers itself the country's legitimate government. General Min Ong Leng is leader of the military-ruled government. He promised in a speech to work toward a democratic system in Myanmar. Myanmar's military said it took power because there was widespread cheating in the 2020 election. Independent election experts say they have seen no serious evidence for this claim. Tom Andrews is the UN Special Diplomat on the situation in Myanmar. He said the international community must take steps to limit the military's access to weapons and money. Andrews added that Myanmar's military had carried out mass killings, attacks on hospitals and humanitarian targets, and the bombing and burning of villages. I'm Katie Weaver. A letter written to a 12-year-old girl in Lithuania was delivered in December, almost 51 years after it was sent. Now in her 60s, Genovifa Klonowska said after being handed the letter, I thought that someone was pranking me. A prank is a trick that is done as part of a joke. The letter included a handmaid, colored rose, and two paper dolls. It was sent to Klonowska by a young girl in Poland. They exchanged letters in what is known as a pen pal program, when people write letters to each other without actually meeting. The letter, together with seventeen others, was discovered this past summer when a wall was taken down in a former post office in Vilnius. Churges Velutis is the owner of the building. The workers suggested we throw the old letters away, but I called the post office instead, Velutis explained. I'm so happy they got interested. The letters, from the late 1960s and early 1970s, were likely hidden by a postal worker after he searched them for money or valuables, Velutis said. Lithuania was part of the Soviet Union then. The senders were family members, or pen pals, from places such as Australia, Poland, or Russia. Street names and their numbering have changed in Vilnius. Post office workers spent months looking for the people who were supposed to receive the letters, the recipients. Only five recipients were found. In several cases, children of dead recipients were handed a lost letter. Demonte Zebruskaita, head of the customer service department at Lithuania Post, said, We felt a moral duty to do this. Zebruskaita added, One lady compared the experience to receiving a message from a bottle thrown into sea. People were emotional. Some people felt they saw a part of daily life 
of their deceased parents. In the letter to Klonowska, sent from Kochery in Poland and stamped in 1970, a girl named Eva complains buses no longer reach her village, forcing her to walk in minus 23 degrees Celsius cold. She also asks for pictures of actors. Now in her sixties, Klonowska has no memory of Eva. She probably wrote Eva after finding her address in an advertisement for pen pals in a newspaper. Their relationship stopped after the letter was not delivered. The loss was not life-changing, said Klonowska. She then asked, What if they delivered a lost letter from a suitor to his love, and their wedding never happened? I'm John Russell. High school graduation rates in the United States dropped in at least 20 states after the first full school year during the coronavirus health crisis. The information comes from the publication Chalkbeat. It suggests that the pandemic may have ended almost 20 years of improvement in high school graduation rates in America. Graduation rates fell in some states, even though educators eased requirements to help struggling students. The information comes from only 26 of the 50 states, but it is the latest concerning trend in education. Last year, many students attended classes online, and the new coronavirus continues to affect learning and teaching. Educators fear that the next several graduating classes could be affected even more. In 2020, when schools closed for the final months of the school year, most states eased graduation requirements. They reported a rise in graduation rates. But the results were different for the class of 2021. In 20 of 26 states that have released their information, graduation rates fell. The Associated Press reports that complete national data will likely not be available until 2023. Those decreases were less than a percentage point in some states, like Colorado, Georgia, and Kansas. But in other states, they were larger. Illinois, Oregon, and North Dakota reported graduation rate decreases of two percentage points. Indiana, Maine, Nevada, South Dakota, and West Virginia reported drops of at least one point. Where rates did increase, growth was small. Florida has had graduation rates increase by more than two percentage points every year for 10 years. But in 2021, it gained just one-tenth of a percentage point. Robert Balfons is an education researcher with Johns Hopkins University in Maryland. We do have to be concerned that grad rates are down and that some number of kids that earned a diploma, they've learned less than prior years, he said. Last year's graduating class was affected in many different ways. In Nevada's Washoe County Schools, for example, the graduation rate dropped by 2.6 percentage points. Many high school students worked longer hours or spent more time caring for family members. Carly Lott is a counselor at a school in Reno, Nevada. She became concerned last year when students started working 40 to 50 hours a week. Some students worked during remote school days, while others took late-night hours that made them too tired to do schoolwork. Graduation rates across the whole country are still higher now than they were a few years ago, but the decreases are troubling to many people. In 2001, an estimated 71% of U.S. students who started public high school graduated four years later. By 2019, that number had risen to 86%. Observers say that increase is a great success in American education. A study by the Brookings Institution suggested that the increases were the result of new pressure on states and schools from the federal government. 
The study found little evidence that the long-term improvements were caused by lowering graduation requirements. Some fear that all the effects of the pandemic will hit future graduating classes hardest. In both Oregon and Nevada, the share of first-year high school students who finished last school year in a position to graduate was about 10 percentage points lower than before the pandemic. Educators are hopeful, however, that last year's drop is not the sign of a trend. In Peoria, Illinois, the graduation rate fell four points after rising for years. But Superintendent Sharon desmoulin Karat said the school system is expanding measures for struggling students. Every week, a team of educators finds students with failing grades and provides them extra support. The school system has added ways working students can earn credits in the evenings or on weekends. It has also employed workers to help students who are in the juvenile justice system to finish school. It is not easy, Desmoulin Karat said. It's definitely a marathon, not a sprint. That means the effort is unlike a short race, but more like a long, difficult one. I'm Dan Novak. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. In the years after World War I, new technologies changed America. Technology made it possible for millions of people to improve their lives. It also brought great changes in American society. Harry Monroe and Kay Gallant tell more about the technological and social changes that took place in the United States in the early 1920s. Some of the most important changes came as a result of the automobile and the radio. Automobiles began to be mass-produced. They were low enough in cost, so many Americans could buy them. Gasoline was low in cost, too. Together, these developments put America on the move as never before. Automobiles made it easy for Americans to travel. Trucks made it easy for goods to be transported. Many people and businesses moved out of crowded, noisy cities. They moved to open areas outside cities, suburbs. As automobiles helped Americans spread out, the radio helped bring them closer together. Large networks could broadcast the same radio program to many stations at the same time. Soon, Americans everywhere were listening to the same programs. They laughed at the same jokes, sang the same songs, heard the same news. Another invention that produced big changes in American life was the motion picture. Edison began making short motion pictures at the turn of the century. In 1903, a movie called The Great Train Robbery was the first to tell a complete story. In 1915, D.W. Griffith made a long, serious movie called Birth of a Nation. By the early 1920s, many American towns had a movie theater. Most Americans went to see the movies at least once a week. The movie industry became a big business. 
people might not know the names of government officials, but they knew the names of every leading actor and actress. Movies were fun. They provided a change from the day-to-day -day troubles of life. They also were an important social force. Young Americans tried to copy what they saw in the movies, and they dreamed about faraway places and a different kind of life. A young farm boy could imagine himself as romantic hero Douglas Fairbanks or comedian Charlie Chaplin. A young city girl could imagine herself as the beautiful and brave Mary Pickford. Rich families and poor families saw the same movies. Their children shared the same wish to be like the movie stars. In this way, the son of a banker and the son of a factory worker had much in common. The same was true for people from different parts of the country. In the early 1920s, Americans also began reading the same publications. The publishing industry used some of the same kinds of mass production methods as the automobile industry. It began producing magazines in larger amounts. It began selling the same magazines all over the country. One of the most widely read magazines was the Saturday Evening Post. In 1902, it sold about 300,000 copies each week. Twenty years later, it sold more than two million copies each week. Americans everywhere shared the same information and advice in such nationwide magazines. The information was not always correct, the advice was not always good, but the effect was similar to that caused by the automobile and radio. Parts of American society were becoming more alike. They were trying to move toward the same kind of life, economically and socially. Other industries use the techniques of assembly line production to make their goods, too. They discovered that producing large numbers of goods reduced the cost of each one. One company that expanded in this way was the Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company. It was called A&P for short. The A&P was one of the first large American grocery stores to sell all kinds of food. It sold milk, meat, bread, canned fruits, and vegetables, all in the same store. Shopping at the A&P was much faster and easier than going to different stores to get different kinds of food. In 1912, A&P had 400 stores in the United States. About 10 years later, it had more than 11,000 stores. It could buy huge amounts of goods and sell each at a very low price. Mass production also came to the clothing industry. People began wearing clothes made in factories instead of by a family member or local tailor. Before long, the same kinds of clothes could be found everywhere. Mass production removed some differences that had marked Americans in the past. Prices dropped, so people with little money could still buy nice clothes. It became more difficult to look at Americans and know by their clothes if they were rich or poor. Social changes also resulted from great progress in medical research. 
Doctors and scientists reported new developments in the fight against disease. This progress gave most Americans a longer life. In 1900, for example, the average person in the United States could expect to live 49 years. By 1927, the average person could expect to live 59 years. Life expectancy rates climbed because doctors and scientists developed effective ways to prevent or treat diseases such as tuberculosis, typhoid, diphtheria, and influenza. Yellow fever and smallpox were no longer a threat. One new medicine was insulin. It was used to treat diabetes. A man-made version gave diabetics the insulin their bodies did not have. It cut the death rate from the disease from 70% to about 1%. Doctors and scientists also learned the importance of vitamins to good health. Now they could cure several diseases caused by a lack of vitamins. Americans in the 1920s lived much better than their fathers and mothers. A man received more pay than in the past, even though he worked fewer hours each day. He lived in a better house with new labor-saving devices. He had a car to drive to work and to take his family on holiday trips. He received a better education than his father. He and his family wore better clothes. They ate healthier foods. The average American in the 1920s had more time for sports and entertainment. He enjoyed listening to the radio and watching movies. He was more informed about national and world events. Life was good for many Americans as World War I ended and the nation entered the 1920s, yet that life was far from perfect. Many Americans did not have the same chances to improve their lives. Black Americans continued to suffer from racism. Society continued to deny them their rights as citizens. Women did not have equal rights either. For example, they could not vote. It was during this time that the United States experienced one of its worst incidents of public hatred. Many people turned strongly against labor unions and leftists. They feared a threat to democracy. The federal government took action against what it called political extremists. Many of the charges were unfair. Many innocent lives were harmed. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. <laughs> 